I'm introducing the next speaker, which is Peter Richterich, is a reader in the School of Mathematics at Edinburgh, working on ML and statistical optimization. All right, so, uh, so I'll take a completely different approach. Uh, I will not <clears throat> talk about any applications whatsoever, not because there are no applications, because I just thought uh, for added variety to these uh, already excellent talks here, maybe uh, a different approach would be uh, desirable and welcome. So what I'll do, I'll talk about an algorithm for solving linear systems. Now, I work on optimization. I don't even work on linear systems. But somehow this algorithm uh, sheds light on lots of stuff that's going on, exciting stuff in, in stochastic optimization and machine learning. So if you've heard of algorithms such as stochastic gradient descent, or you've heard of algorithms such as randomized coordinates, and if you've heard of duality, if you've heard of mini-batching, parallelism, distributed computing, all of these things come together in this algorithm, and one can understand a lot about what's going on in stochastic optimization and stochastic algorithms for machine learning just by looking and examining uh, this, this method. So I'll go slowly, and I'll take uh, questions during uh, the, the talk. I don't have a number of slides that I want to cover. In fact, uh, you probably know that I have like 200 slides there, right? So I can stop at any time. There's no time where, where, where I really have to, uh, really have to stop. So, uh, so the stuff that I'll be describing is joint work, uh, published in, in two pieces of work with, with my former PhD student, Robert Gaur, who is now at INRIA. And uh, this is what I already said. The, the method sheds light on lots of what's going on in, in stochastic optimization machine learning, such as the things that I did not mention is stochastic Newton descent, stochastic quasi-Newton methods, or even on computing inverse matrices, very large matrices, how do you take inverse, it relates to randomized gossip literature, and so on and so forth. So here is the problem. We have a linear system. And it's big because we live in the era of big data. And it's big, you can tell, because the uh, font is really big, right? So this is a big linear system. And by big, I mean there's lots and lots of rows, lots of equations in the system. Uh, you can think of these as measurements. Uh, you can think of these as M images. Okay? You, you, you get lots of data. And, and N might also be big. Now, how do you solve a very, very big linear system? So uh, usually when you have something which is very large, you want to have an iterative technique. You don't want to have a direct method. And now a standard iterative technique would, in each iteration, need to look at all of this data at once. So it would need to do a matrix vector multiply in each iteration, so something like A times X, right? But then it means that you touch every single data point. And if the data base is maybe 10 terabytes, that's not what you want to do. So uh, a paradigm in stochastic optimization, machine learning, and all kinds of other fields is that you should design an iterative method which looks at only small parts of the data at a time. Right? So here I'll assume uh, that uh, this system has a solution. If it doesn't, then, uh, then I don't know what I'm talking about here. Okay? So there's the one assumption that I'll, that I'll throw in. Right, so, uh, so let's design an algorithm together. And, and feel free to ask questions at any point in time. So this is the algorithm that I'll talk about. Uh, what's going on here? The system Ax equals to b is a difficult large system. I just told this matrix A is huge. Now, if Ax is equal to b, and if you pre-multiply the system by any matrix, S, and this will be a random matrix, and this is where randomized optimization and randomized algorithms uh, kick in, then S transpose AX is going to be equal to S transpose B. Right? You're not losing the solution. Right? If AX equals to B, this is also true. So the solution to this system uh, contains all the solutions of the original system. Right? Now this is a random system, and imagine that matrix S is in fact the vector. If matrix S is a vector, then this is just a single equation. Now, solving a system of one equations is very easy, right? And that is the decomposition, right? So you see, you see that we have transformed something very, very large into something very tiny. Lots of equations into a single equation. And on top of that, 
is not a deterministic equation, it's a random equation because S is random. So for instance, this random vector S could be a random vector of all zeros and a one in a random position. In that case, this is just a random equation in the system. But S could be anything else. Okay? Now, obviously you cannot just reduce AX equals to B to one of these uh, simpler systems uh, if S is a vector. So what we want to do, we want to introduce a learning process into this. We want to do this iteratively, and we'll condense all the information that we have learned so far into vector xt. That's our best guess at what the solution is. Now, if we have an iteration t guess xt, we want to keep the guess. We believe that the guess is good, so we don't want to deviate from it too much. But at the same time, we want to learn from this... Uh, random sample of the system. So what do you do? You, you find the least perturbation of xt which satisfies uh, this uh, random system. So you project, in other words, xt onto this sketched system. Okay. Does it make sense? Okay. And if you keep going, if you keep doing this, then you hope this is going to converge and you find the solution of the system. Okay. Right. So now notice, uh, if S is, let's say, the identity matrix, which you can pick, you can pick that as a parameter of the method, then obviously you're projecting something, whatever the XT is, onto A is equals to B, so you solve the system in one step. So the one-step algorithm, which, which, which is essentially cheating, is a special case of this family of algorithms. Right. right. So here is a completely different point of view, and now I'm alluding to something which is very well developed in, in, in optimization, this theory of duality. Uh, the same algorithm can be seen from a very different pers perspective. What have I done here? I took this problem, and this is an optimization problem. Notice that uh, I'm talking about the algorithm as an optimization problem, not, not the original problem itself. The original problem was not an optimization problem, it was just a problem solve A x equals to B. Once you have this optimization problem, which defines the next iterate, you can say what we can ask the question: What is the dual of this problem like? How does it look like? And this, in fact, is the dual of that problem, whatever that means. If you have never seen duality, don't worry, because on the next slide you'll visually see why this is dual and what's going on. Okay. So let's let's parse this. What are we doing here? So let's forget about this part. Let's forget about this part. Let's just look at subject two. You want the next iterate x to be x t. That's your previous iterate plus something, right? Usually, this is how algorithms are written. xt plus 1 is xt plus something else. Now, the something is going to be random because s is in here, and s is this random object, this random matrix, right? b inverse 80, 80 is the data, b some positive definite matrix that you choose. Thing of b as being just identity. And lambda is the thing you can tweak. So what are we really doing here? We look at b inverse ats, which is a random matrix, and we multiply this by some vector. So we're really looking in a random subspace spanned by the columns of the product of these three matrices. Right? And we want to choose something in a random subspace, and that subspace passes through xt. Right. Now, in this random subspace, it is very unlikely that the solution will lie. Right? Why would the solution lie in a random subspace uh, passing through xt, through the current iterate. Well, there's no reason why, why that should be the case. So, you would like to do as good as you possibly can on the random subspace, which means find the solution there, the point there which is as close to the solution of the system, which you do not know, as possible. So does this seem like a very optimistic goal to hand? So you say no, this is not an optimistic goal. Can we, can we do this? Or you say yes? Well, I'm, I'm just thinking we don't have access to x star. So. Yeah, so, so there's, we don't have access to x star. This is a problem with this algorithm, right? How can we run this algorithm if what we want to find is x star and we are asked to project x star onto some random subspace? So that is a very strange algorithm, right? Now, it turns out that this xt plus 1 is exactly the same one as this xt plus 1 defined in this way. That's what optimization duality will tell you. What does it mean? Well, there's no x star here, right? x star doesn't appear here directly. 
it appears indirectly in B, AX star, okay, but not directly, which means you can actually compute XC plus one. But that means you can complete, compute this XC plus one, right? So this gives you insight into what the algorithm is doing. And the insight is that by running this, which you can run, there's no X star there, you're in fact computing the best approximation of the unknown solution on a random subspace passing through the previous iterator. Okay, so duality gives you this insight, but at the same time, as you'll see later on, if we don't have enough discussion, you'll see. If we do, then you won't. So let's have discussion so that uh, I don't have to show you those slides. Uh, you'll see that there is a deeper duality uh, going on here as well. Right, so do you guys have any questions about this? I'll, I'll take questions during the talk. Yes? Uh, last, if you go to last slide, please. Sure. This is a very realistic about the problem. Why would it be uh, reminiscent of proximal methods? Because because you can think of this as indicator of that set, and you put it in there. Yeah, there there actually is a connection, and we can take it offline. Yeah, there is a connection in fact. Yeah, there is a certain you, you can think of this being an iteration of a certain proximal method when you apply smoothing. Uh, yeah, so there is a positive answer to that, but that's not the kind of thing I I want to get into right now. Yes, so at each step we take S randomly from a certain distribution that you decide on at the beginning. And the distribution is, is essentially a parameter of your algorithm. You, the optimizer, the computer scientist, the data scientist, decide what distribution you want to draw these matrices from, and then just keep drawing the matrices from the distribution in an IID fashion. And you never change the distribution. Okay, so there's always a different one each at each iteration. Okay, any more questions, remarks? Yeah. What would be the convergence criteria for this algorithm? So, if we don't have enough uh, discussion, you you know you'll see. Okay. <laughs> uh, but uh, but this is great. So in fact, this will almost always work. Uh, the the assumptions are extremely weak. In fact, the assumptions don't say anything about. The, the particular distribution, what that should really be, could be Gaussian distribution of vectors, could be Gaussian matrices, could be any other continuous or discrete distribution over matrices. There is a certain assumption there, but the assumption is extremely weak. So, so, so the best way to, to think about this intuitively is that unless you really screw it up a lot, and let's say keep choosing the same vector all the time, if you kind of explore the space a little bit, this will work. And it will work exponentially fast. And you can be smart about this, and the exponential rate can be really good for you, or, or it can be bad, but it will be exponential rate. Okay. Right, so got the primal and dual problem. Now, for those of you uh, who haven't seen duality before, here is duality in the simplest uh, possible, optimization duality in the simplest possible setup, which is this setup described here. So what does the first algorithm do? So the first algorithm, let's call it sketch and project. Sketch because this random linear transformation is usually called sketching. Okay? So we sketch the system and we get some kind of random estimate of what the system looks like. And we project the previous iterate onto the sketch and sketch system. So sketch and project. This is what it does. And uh, if you draw what's going on, you've got X star, which lives somewhere here in x star plus null space of s transpose a. What is this? Well, this pink space is exactly the solution space of this. Okay? And I just shift it so that it passes through x star. Well, it always passes through x star, so that's fine. I don't have to shift it. And xt probably doesn't lie there, so I'm going to project xt onto this sketch space. And that's my next iterate. Okay? So this is what sketch and project does. Now, what is the other algorithm? The dual one, the constraint. You constrain yourself to a random a random space, you don't want to explore all those dimensions, why don't you? Because maybe there's so many dimensions, you don't want to look at them all, all at once. Maybe because th there's so many dimensions as you have data points in your problem. Right? That's why you want to constrain yourself to a random subspace. And then you do the best approximation of the unknown uh, vector that you want to find in there. So what's going on there? Well, it turns out that this blue space, this constraint space is exactly this space. Okay? Which means if I want, if I move from xt 
to the base point, which is as close to x star as possible, I actually get x t plus 1 as well. Okay? So the idea here is that this blue space and this pink space, they are orthogonal complements of each other. Okay? And in, in a B in a product, so if B is identity, they're just orthogonal complements. Otherwise, they're orthogonal complements with respect to some uh, geometry defined by the positive definite matrix B. And that's why you get exactly the same point. And that's a uh, pictorial proof of duality in this setup. Okay? So do you guys have any uh, questions about this? Is this reasonably clear? Also. Possible question over there. No, okay. Good. So that's that. Now, once you write this down, you can actually solve for xt plus one. How do you solve for xt plus one? Well, you can you can find a solution to this system of these two equations. How do you do that? You plug this in there, solve for lambda, and then plug it back. So when I do that, uh, I get this system. Right. Uh, well, I, I, I do the plugging on the next slide, but on this slide, I just want to highlight that the algorithm can also be thought of in the following way, that you reduce the problem of solving one huge linear system into a sequence of, so, of small random systems. Okay. So in each iteration, you solve this system, which is small, if S maybe has just one column, there's just an, one equation, there's another equation. So there's two equations, two dimensional thing, right? Uh, and you do many of these. So you can think of this as randomized decomposition. And this is a theme which runs through uh, modern machine learning and optimization and other fields as well at the moment. You want to decompose something that is large, and, and, and one way to do that is to decompose randomly, and there are some theoretical uh, reasons why you want to do that randomly, rather than in some deterministic order, let's say. Right, so now I'm actually plugging this x in here, solving for lambda, and then plugging it back. So I actually want to know what is xt plus 1, and this is xt plus 1. It looks like a horrible formula, and I don't want you to memorize this. At one point, when we came up with this algorithm, a student of mine suggested maybe, maybe we should call the algorithm BASSA, BS. SA, okay? That was, that was the name of the algorithm, but uh, I said no. Right, so the point is you can write it down in a closed form, and this is the pseudo-inverse of this matrix. Why do we have pseudo-inverse? Uh, this thing does not have a unique solution in lambda. It has a unique solution in x, but not in lambda. And we can choose any solution, and pseudo-inverse gives us one particular solution, which is the least norm solution, so we're just happy with that. If that's what the pseudo inverse uh, is here for. But I'm not showing you this to, to, to confuse you for, with, with a complicated formula, but this is why I'm showing this to you. Now imagine that I subtract x star from both sides of this equation. So minus x star here, minus x star there. Now what is b? b is ax star. Right? So I get lots of x stars there, and this is exactly what I get. So what I get is xt plus 1 minus x star, that's the error at the t plus first iteration, is equal to this random matrix multiplied by the previous error. Okay? Why is this a random matrix? Because it depends on the s which is random. Okay? So what am I doing here? I'm taking previous error and just multiplying by something random and I'm getting new error. So this is something like a randomized fixed point method. So, so randomization enters the area of fixed point methods as well. Uh, if you know anything about fixed point methods, you know that you need these, uh, the, the, the operator to be a contraction for this to work. Now, in this case, this is automatically going to be contracted because it's a projection. This 1 minus b inverse z is actually projection on the sketch space. And a projection matrix has only eigenvalue zeros or ones. So obviously the largest eigenvalue cannot be larger than one, so it is a contraction. It's not a strict contraction though, okay? which, which is weird. So you want this to be strict con contraction on average, because it's a randomized method, and then it's going to work. Okay? And that's the assumption that uh, one will have to throw in, but it's a very weak assumption. All right, so that's what we're doing. Now, how much more time do I have? 
Uh, no, we've got lots of time. Excellent. So maybe I just stop here for, for a minute and uh, let's discuss what I just talked about and then I move on. So even this is the point where I can just finish. I'll just keep going. Yeah. Just a very quick practical question. Yes. Um, what kind of scale of, uh, of data would you actually be using this one? At what right. point does it become a big data? Right. So, so, so the general message in, in, in big data optimization, big data analysis is this. If, if you don't want to look at all the data in every iteration for any kind of algorithm that you have, you want to look at a subset, and then you have to decide how, how you choose that subset of the data, and usually you want to look at a random subset. That's when you uh, use randomized decomposition methods, and that's, that's more gen that applies more generally than just to solving uh, linear systems. So let's say if you have so many equations that, uh, you know, many, many more equations than the number of rows and a direct method wouldn't really work. Multiplying matrix by a vector would, would be way too slow. Okay. If you think about SGD, stochastic gradient ascent, and maybe I should use the word we're now for a while, because I, the, the slide which this describes this is probably the slide number 100, so I, I will never get there. So, so the method which I just described, in fact, and that is, these, these are some new results which are not published yet. In fact, it, it can be thought of as stochastic gradient ascent applied to a very particular reformulation of the problem. And stochastic gradient ascent, as you know, is a key method in, in, for training machine learning models, empirical risk minimization. So what you have is function fx, which is equal to expectation, now over these matrices from the distribution D, of some functions fs, X, which I'm not going to tell you what they are. Okay, there's just some formula there. But these are random functions, and each depends on X and the random matrix S. And this is possibly an infinite expectation. Right? The method that I've described, in fact, is equivalent to this. XT minus and just uh, gradient of FSX. And you draw S from the distribution D. Okay? Pardon me? Where's the us? Okay, well, this is stochastic gradient descent. Yeah. Descent. Did you use the ascent? Uh, I said ascent because in the dual you would be doing ascent. Okay. And those are the slides which I'm about to, oh, okay. you know, look at. Yeah, it's coming up. And notice this is step size one. Step size one means you do the exact projection. If you went a little bit further than that space, there will be some, some, some other step size here. Okay. Right, that's an excellent question, and, and there's, there's very complicated answers to that, and very simple answer. And I'll give you the very simple now, yeah, and the very complicated later on, if you're still no, around. Yeah, sure, okay. So the very simple one is that I'm describing the algorithms in such generality, because S can be any distribution, that it doesn't really make sense to ask the question, what is the cost of one iteration of this thing, okay? But I can tell you how many iterations it's going to take, and, and this, this is coming up. Well, if, if you deal with the data, how do you know? If you... If you deal with the data, I'm not, the I'm not deal, dealing with streaming setup here. Oh. I'm not. Okay. So here, everything is stored in one matrix so A. Yeah, because you have just one matrix A, and it's finite matrix, so... Yeah. And there's the data. Yeah, but I don't know what to say when it's unbounded. Okay. Uh, so then, do you have like an um, um, error guarantee system for summations, tight bounds? Yes, so we have tight bounds, okay. and one reason why we have tight bounds is that we can say exactly what the expected iterates look like. I don't even have an inequality. For the expected iterates, I can give you equation. Okay. Do you expect to have a specific batch size or is it uh, or is it yeah, so, so the batch size, you can think of the batch size as the number of columns in the matrix S. So if you have just one column in matrix S, that means you're looking at one row at a time, essentially, okay? And that's batch size of one. And if S has more columns, you have larger batch size. And uh, what you choose is, it depends really on the problem that you have, on the structure of A, on the computer that you have, Yeah, then you can just pick the right uh, distribution. Okay. 
Even there, the tight bounds are in complete generality for any distribution. Okay. Right. And in fact, there, there's one, one thing that I should say about this batching, and that is that in standard machine learning, you, uh, when you have mini-batching, you can only hope to get linear speed up in the mini-batch size. That is the best possible scenario, and it only happens when the data is somehow orthogonal, independent, or something like this. In this setup, since everything is simplified in some sense, because we're looking only at linear systems, you have the opposite inequality. So you have at least speed up, which is equal to the mini batch size. So it's super linear speed up in the mini batch size. Right, so now to the second part, and I have last five minutes. So we wrote this first paper on this, and then we realized that in fact when we did the analysis, uh, the assumption that we, that we threw on, on the distribution S implied that there must be a unique solution of the system. So we did, a, did an analysis which implied un, unique solution, and then we asked the following question. What happens if you don't have a unique solution? Do we have to change the algorithm? It turns out you don't have to change the algorithm. The same algorithm still solves the problem if, in, if you have multi, multiple solutions, but then it finds this solution, where C is the starting iterate. It just happens to find the projection of the starting iterate onto A x equals to B. But once you have that, then you have an optimization problem, and, and we're in business. So I'm doing optimization, so I know stuff about optimization. Right? So then you can write the do of this optimization problem. So, so notice the difference. Before, the optimization was defining one iteration. Now the optimization is exactly, exactly describing the goal of the entire thing. So now I have a dual problem. And this dual problem turns out to be quadratic, because this is just quadratic and y. This is linear. It's maximization. That's why there will be ascent. And uh, it's dual, so dual. And it will be randomized, so it's stochastic dual ascent. So now the question is, the algorithm that I described in terms of the iterates x, can it be somehow understood from the perspective of the dual? And the answer is yes. And in the dual, you get class of methods which we call uh, subspace, randomized subspace methods. You can get randomized Newton ascend as a special case, randomized coordinate ascend, randomized coordinate ascend with important sampling, randomized Newton ascend with important sampling, and so on and so forth. So you get anything you wish there uh, in the dual, and these are exactly equivalent to the stochastic gradient descent type of methods in the primal. What do I mean by this? This is what I mean. This is the method in the dual. You have one or two more minutes? Three, even better. Good. So this is the dual method. It's extremely simple. So let's just, let's just look at this. I take the dual variable, and there's as many dual variables as there's rows in A. Okay? And I add to this a random matrix S, which is the same random matrix as before, times some vector lambda. So what am I doing? Well, I'm moving in the random subspace spanned by the columns of S. And then I'm doing something very silly, which is selection of a random matrix. Why should a random matrix be something smart, right? But then I'm doing something smart, and that is the choice of lambda, right? I cannot choose both randomly because then I was just wandering around in a kind of random walk. So the lambda is chosen in such a way that I maximize the dual function value in lambda. Okay, so it's a greedy selection of lambda. And if I do that, I definitely ascend, right? I go up. Definitely, because the worst thing I can do is choose lambda is equal to zero, and then the function doesn't change. So I cannot go down with the function. So this is a very simple algorithm. And in fact, if you do that, this is precisely what I was telling you about for the primal algorithm. What do I mean by this? I take these iterates, and I map them through a linear mapping, and I get the primal iterates. And there's one-to-one -one correspondence. It's exactly the same thing. Which means that these randomized subspace methods in the dual are equivalent to these uh, randomized gradient type methods in the dual. Okay? And then I'll just throw in this last slide. So then you can show that the thing converges. And you can essentially look at any type of conver convergence you wish. You can look at the primal error, duality gap, residual, primal iterates in norm, whatever you wish. And you get the same exponential rate with rate rho. And the rate rho only depends on the distribution of, uh, of those random matrices and on A and on capital B on the problem. And then you can visit that expression and see what you get in special cases. And you choose uh, 
the algorithm, the parameters, the distribution, the way in, in which you wish, depending on the application. So I'll stop here. And uh, if you guys have any other questions. Yes. So all of these are in expectation. Can you uh, do any of these monotonically increase or decrease regardless? So of the, the algorithm actually is monotonic. Okay. So, so the random sequence uh -huh. uh, is monotonic precisely, for instance, the random sequence of dual function values is just going up always, okay. never goes down. So it is monotonic. Now, you can combine this with, let's say, Markov inequality, and you can get result in high probability. I just didn't do it. So, so that's completely fine. This, this rate, in fact, describes the, the, the practical behavior. So you, you, you converge to the right thing in the classical sense, even though the convergence concept is, is weaker than the classical convergence concept. OK. I think there were many questions during the talk. So let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.